I'm really looking forward to sharing a range of ideas uh, about what I see as the emerging future of work and learning uh, in these extraordinary times. I'm just going to jump right in and start showing some images. Uh, hopefully, the a number of the ideas that I'm going to offer will spark some thinking and hopefully some action uh, where people can hopefully get some ideas to be able to take into your own realm, into your own arena, to be able to apply to some of these seismic changes that we're all going through. So uh, I'm just going to jump right into it. Uh, so I'm Gary Bowles. Um, I've got three hats that I spin constantly. Chair for the Future of Work with Singularity University. Uh, I've got a small consulting company called Charette, um, a new book called The Next Rules of Work, and a small software company called eParachute focused on career change. And uh, I've got nine courses on LinkedIn Learning with about a million learners. And I'll, I'll be talking about this era of unbundled learning. Uh, but I think what's helpful is for us to step back and look at what is really driving so much of the change of our times. And back in April of 2020, do you remember how long ago that was? <laughs> Uh, I wrote an article called The Great Reset, and my thesis was that we were going with this, our response to this pandemic, we were going through an accelerated set of changes that we were all co-creating together in new um, ways to be able to approach work and learning. And I suggested that it was going to have these ripple effects on a range of different arenas. It was going to change how we think about the location of our work. And of course, now with so many people still doing remote and distributed work that has continued for, for many, uh, it was going to have ripple effects on work markets. That is, wherever work markets were less resilient, the impact on the asymmetry between workers and work markets was going to be really, really accented. And then that was going to have a range of ripple effects on different industries, on supply chains. And so what was seemingly predictable back in, in April of 2020, I said, I think it's going to follow three phases because previous resets like the Great Recession have basically followed this same arc. There's this initial phase of sort of falling off the cliff with almost complete uncertainty. There's a middle phase where it's sort of looks like a fever chart or a heartbeat where we're sort of riffling along the bottom. We turn the lights back on because everything's okay. Oh, nope, the infection rate just spiked again. We have to turn the lights back off. And then there would be this hopeful period of rebuilding later on that would allow us to be able to create essentially the dynamics of a new economy. And uh, but, the, but the challenge for so many is that actually each of our lived experience throughout this period has been different based on a Venn diagram of the infection rates of the virus, the policies of your country, the specifics of your industry and your organization, what your team is working on, your work role within the team, the projects that you're working on, how many people might or might not be coming to a workplace that you might or might not be going to today, how far that workplace is, and lastly, your own health and the health of your coworkers. And you add all of those different elements together and what you got was, what I, I use the Nordic phrase, same storm, different boats. You had a different lived experience depending upon all those different elements of the Venn diagram. And so for some, because of these waves of infection and because of the ripple effects for how we deal with this global pandemic, we've gone through a series of resets. And depending upon all those different elements added up, some almost shrugged off the impact of the virus. There's a company that I advise here outside of Denver, Colorado in the United States, and they basically think that they were able to respond to suddenly remote and distributed work in about 36 hours. And there are other organizations that still do not have the handle on this. And there's communities that are still dealing with really, really deep challenges of having so many impacts of the, not just the virus response, but of the, the challenges in the shifts in work and the shifts in learning. So what I'd like to point to is it's likely that this middle phase is probably for many of us sort of the new normal or the new abnormal. And, and there's huge challenges, of course, that come with that, but there are also huge possibilities. So what do I mean by those possibilities? Well, 
if you look at the dynamics of, of how we continually change the rules of work, you go back to the industrial era, you go back to the agricultural era. Um, there are all these different phases where we as humans have approached work in different ways. And we've always had these shifts from following old rules of work. We worked in factories. Doesn't mean people don't still work in factories. It just means there's fewer of us doing that. And we work in different ways. Then there's new rules. We work in offices. We use technology. And then there's what I call the next rules. That is the rules that are coming. And I wanna talk about some of those rules and many of the meta trends that are driving those rules. So, so some of the macro things we can be thinking about is we know that distributed and, and remote work is, a, is now a thing, but depending upon the country, in some countries, it's 25 to 30% of all workers engage in remote and distributed work. And in other countries, it's a rounding error because they're much more informal economies. We know that organizations are going through really significant shifts. And I wanna talk about the shifts and what that means for skills. We know that how, where, and when we learn is going through a really significant reset. And that all of that in turn has an impact on work markets. And I wanna offer a framing for how to think about that. So speaking of work markets, if we're going to try to understand how work has changed, let's talk about what work is. And those of you who might've heard me speak before, some of these ideas will be familiar, but I want to make sure we're setting the table with how some of these macro trends are shifting so quickly. So I maintain that work is basically just three things, and this is mechanically how work works. It's a problem to be solved, and it doesn't matter if it's a dirty floor or a complex market entry strategy or a new course that you're designing for young learners. It's a problem to be solved. How do we solve problems? We perform tasks. If it's a dirty floor, we go to the broom closet and get a broom. And then how we perform those tasks is we have human skills. And so much of the focus with world skills, of course, is understanding, well, what is the demand for those skills? What are the problems that need to be solved? And what are the kinds of tasks that we need to perform? Now, in many organizations, there are always problems to be solved. But unfortunately, what has happened in so much of these sort of newer rules of work, the rules of, in many cases, the office or the way that we learn and educational institutions, is we tend to forget sometimes what the problem to be solved was or what the human skills were, and we focus on tasks. And especially in organizations, we become very task-centric, and we group them together, we call them processes, and we kind of fall in love with those processes. How many times has somebody told you when you try to do something new, oh, we don't do it that way, or we tried that before? Well, that's falling in love with tasks and processes. And then, of course, pre-pandemic, if you remember what we were talking about with the future of work in January 2020, it was that robots and software were going to take all those tasks, and there was going to be a lot less work for humans. And then, of course, along came a virus, a great reset. And instead, we realized, no, the shifts in work and learning are actually things we as humans have control over. Because remember, it isn't the pandemic that forced these changes. These are changes we decided to make in response to the pandemic. And so what that allows us to do is to understand we as humans, we can make really different decisions and take collective action very, very quickly. Half the people in the world at some point went through this great reset of work and learning. So that gives us tremendous opportunity if we think about this differently and instead focus on the problems and the skills that we need to be able to solve the problems for today and tomorrow. So if that's how work is changing, what about careers? Well, my father uh, was an author who wrote a, a very popular book called What Color Is Your Parachute? The World's Career Manual. And then after he wrote that book, he wrote one called The Three Boxes of Life. And what he tried to do was to offer a new framing for thinking about how we think about careers and he said, basically, I think they're kind of like three boxes. There's a big chunk of learning at the beginning of our lives and what we often call school and college and university. And then there's a big chunk of work where we are so hopefully solving problems and using our skills and performing tasks. And then in some countries, there is a period of rest, uh, which is often called retirement or what I call the period formerly known as retirement. And that is 
basically the model that a lot of the Western world has followed. It's three boxes and, um, and much of the Eastern world has adopted it as well. And so, so if that's the way that uh, careers have worked in the past, how do we think about what jobs are? So that middle part of work has often been structured into something that we call a job. So a job actually has a half a dozen different characteristics. There's the what of work, which is often your, your skills and problems that you're solving, the where geographically, the who you work with, when you do your work. In many Western and, and often Eastern uh, countries, it's um, typically going to be a nine to five or nine to 10 or <laughs> nine to weekends or uh, how you do your work. That is the, the technologies and the tools that you use to do your work. And then the why, the what is the, the meaning? And if you think of this as being a circle, like all these elements working together, what's happened in traditional work is that each of these different aspects sort of fell into a set of rules. And that's why I talk about this shift in the different phases of rules. One way to think about how that work happens then, and especially how we think about the impact of automation on work, is to think about sort of putting this on a spectrum of the ways that the kinds of problems that we're solving. So here's one way to be thinking about that. So if you think of on the left-hand side on the y-axis, uh, it's, it's a similar problem that we're solving at the bottom over and over again. It's a dirty floor throughout the building. And we have to do that every single day over and over again. So it's the same repetitive task. But at the top of the spectrum, it's actually unique. It's almost like a puzzle. It's a problem to be solved that's very different every single time. And then you look at the bottom and you just look at the x-axis and you say, oh, well, these are the, the ways that we as humans solve those problems. This is the skills that we bring. And if it's very analytical, that is the problem can be broken down into numbers or steps versus at the far end of the axis, it takes creative problem solving. It takes brainstorming. It takes light bulbs going off in our heads to be able to solve them. If you put all of the kinds of work that we do on this landscape, well, you can pretty much say if it's really repetitive and it uses pretty much analytical thinking to do the same thing over and over again, it's not the most fun work, right? Uh, now, maybe if it if it's uses analytical thinking, but it's new problems, oh, that might be more interesting for a lot of people. But as humans, we thrive on unique problems and unique creative ways to solve those problems. And then if we give more and more people the opportunity to approach unique problems with unique creative ways to solve them that they come up with, those are what I call superpowers. And so this is one way to think about the different categories of the way that we've organized work. And when we talk about automation, of course, we think about work as basically being these mind-numbing tasks that we do over and over again. And as humans, we obviously want to do more and more of the work in the upper right corner. But the truth is with new technologies like artificial intelligence, machine learning, and robotic process automation, even some of the tasks that we perform up in that upper right-hand quadrant, where we have our superpowers, even those are increasingly being encroached on by technology. So we need to think in new ways about how we construct work and how we construct work markets to be able to create more and more work opportunity for humans, human-centric work, to be able to help people to develop and use their own superpowers. So how does this affect work markets? Let's look at that landscape. And then I wanna dive, this is all the problem domain, then I wanna dive into the solution domain, how things can have, cha have changed and can change. Now, my economist friends hate it when I oversimplify like this, but this is one way to think about work markets is there's supply, that's the red circle, that's us messy, expensive humans, all our skills. And then there's demand, there's the, the work to be done, things that people are willing to pay for. And again, go back to my model of work being essentially human skills applied to problems. Our capacity as humans, our skills, and there's sort of lots of different kinds of skills, obviously, as world skills is very immersed in, but we could kind of separate them into two categories of bodies of information, bodies of knowledge that we often teach in, in a classroom setting, 
and more flex skills, skills used in a range of different situations. We apply those skills to problems, to work that, that we get paid for. But so if you think of work markets as being this constant process of trying to optimize, that is connect humans to work, you can think of this as essentially an opportunity to be able to expand more, more chances for humans to do work. Oh, well, no, actually, we had that robots and software thing. The rhetoric back in January of 2020 is robots and software were going to take more and more of that demand, and there was going to be less work for humans. And of course, along came a virus. And in a very short period of time, depending upon the Venn diagram of where you lived and all the other factors of your work, in some countries, suddenly the work market shrank dramatically, faster than any time in human history. And so here's how to think about that that process in terms of how work markets are designed. In the United States, we have two different ways of measuring unemployment. Um, the blue line is what we call sort of standard unemployment, and the gold line is real unemployment. And real unemployment includes a bunch of people that actually aren't even looking for work. They don't even count themselves as part of the workforce, or maybe they retired early, they could go back to work, but they couldn't find it or they didn't want to do that kind of work. So our unemployment rate, the real unemployment rate, spiked to almost 23% in three weeks when we went through our first lockdown. In our Great Depression, back in the 1930s, the highest unemployment rate was 25.4%. So you could see how rapidly we went to a dramatic recession. But in Germany, due to completely different policies, the German unemployment rate average for 2021 was 4.3%. And so, and I'll talk a number of, about a number of the ways that you can design work markets to be able to help optimize for much more resilient work markets. But this is why I say same storm, different boats. We've made different decisions about the designs of our work markets around the world and also about our learning markets. So I'm going to give you a framing and I'll keep coming back to this again and again, but I say the ways to think about the domains of the the, the solutions that we're coming up with are solutions that are focused on helping individual populations, solutions that are focused on helping organizations to be able to optimize for this world of constant change, how we can help communities to be able to have be ecosystems in which people can thrive, and then macro policies and approaches when it comes to the future of work and the future of learning, how we can deal with these issues. So back to my oversimplified supply and demand model. So we've added now that there are people that are not seeking work. And so those are that's part of the real unemployment rate of any country. Informal economies, people that do not have formal jobs also fit into this category. And there are some economies that are almost 75% informal work. If you look on the far, uh, on the blue side, uh, the fu there's future demand. That is demand we've not yet created, but could create for the skills that we need to be able to solve problems for tomorrow. And then in the middle, you find that work markets tend to sort of bifurcate. And depending upon work markets around the world, there are people who are highly skilled and therefore have a tremendous amount of flexibility and mobility. And in the United States, we call this the great resignation where those very mobile people have gotten to choose to go to different jobs. But then there's a lot of people in work markets who are underemployed. They have more skills than the work market has taken advantage of. They're underpaid for the work that they do. And so that's often where in work markets where especially the pandemic has taken hold, we call them frontline workers. And they're people that have been the most impacted in hospitals, in retail uh, experiences, in, in schools. And they've often been the ones that have been the most deeply affected. And they're the ones that are the most at risk as we turn the lights back on they're sort of last in and then first out again. So how do we think about the solutions domain? And I'm going to walk through the changes in a number of these different arenas and hopefully offer some new ways to think about them. So this is just more of a framework to approach the problem domain with a set of solutions that span across all these different use cases. But we need to, in markets around the world, encourage greater worker participation, train workers much more rapidly because this is a constantly moving landscape and people whose skills were in demand yesterday are no longer in demand today. 
We've got to reduce the frictions in access to work. That is, we've got to change the way people get hooked up to work and have work opportunities. Some cases that can be gig work and other cases that can be new hiring practices from companies. We have to increase more formal work in economies around the world. Uh, informal work is great as one use case for work, but in many cases, people want more stable, more reliable work and work shifts and pay. And we've got to increase the dynamics of work markets, make them more resilient and stronger uh, as it, for instance, has been done in Germany and the Nordic, a uh, number of the Nordic countries to increase the anchors in work and keep people working, even in very difficult times like the Great Reset. We've got to work not just, to, we've got to invest not just in worker training, but in well being. We've got to look at the whole worker. We've got to reduce the hiring friction in organizations. That is, we've got to start, stop thinking about the ways of continually up requiring jobs so that they require the highest possible level degree or the most at work experience, and instead think of new ways to be able to make it much more accessible to people. We've got to focus, as World Skills does, on 21st century skills. And then that future demand, we can increase that demand with entrepreneurship. I'm going to run through a number of different models for you about how to change a lot of this. And then hopefully during the Q&A, we can dive into any parts of this that might be interesting. But I want to present each of these as an opportunity for you, a new mindset to be able to develop, a new skill set, and then hopefully a new tool set. So one new model that's emerging to change that three boxes model that I talked about is a portfolio of work. Young people in many countries around the world, they still go to high school, elementary school, uh, often college or university. Then they come out and they have a day job, but they might still be learning online. And then they might take a gap month with their friends. And then they're still working at a day job, but they're driving for Uber at night and they're working at a startup with their friends. It is a constantly moving landscape of work and learning and leisure. This is what I call a portfolio of work. This is an opportunity to think about work as essentially having a range of different projects, different problems to be solved. And in some cases, all of those problems and projects are wrapped up in a single job with a single employer and has a traditional paycheck associated with it. But increasingly, we're finding that People, especially that are curious about a range of different issues and opportunities and things to learn about, are treating it more as an a, a, essentially a portfolio approach, a hedge against constant change that allows them to invest their time in a couple of different activities that all might bring future economic benefit and work satisfaction. So if that's how we can think about the framing for our careers and our work, what about jobs, this work roles thing. Well, there's an emerging approach that are called flexible work roles. And, uh, and there's a whole set of mechanics that different companies are building around this. Salesforce.com, the big online services company, they have a flex work role decision-making process that actually focuses on these different aspects of a job and empowers the worker to make decisions in context with their team about what is optimized for every single week and month. So with the great reset of work, we can think about all of these different elements of a job becoming sort of broken apart and then reconfigured, rebundled back together. We know that the where of work is going to be increasingly with opportunities for remote and distributed. Now, as I said, in some countries, it's only 25% of the jobs really can be fully distributed. But you can have more flexible shifts. You can have more flexible ways to have people dynamically bind around problems in many work roles that do not require the traditional office of the traditional workplace in every single case. Who we work with is becoming far more distributed depending upon your kind of work. I don't call this a workforce or a network, I call it a work net. It increasingly looks like a network of human beings solving problems together. The what becomes more and more of a portfolio, even within the same organization. You can have a portfolio of projects and work with a range of different teams. The when becomes part of that flex work. It becomes a set of decisions about where you need to be and what you need to be doing and who you need to be working with in any particular hour, day, week, or month. 
the how we're doing our work and our learning, we know is going to become increasingly digital. And then the why for many people starts to shift from meaning, pay, paying uh, our rent and putting a roof over our family's heads to purpose, why we do our work. What is the basic driver for our work? Now, if that's the model for our careers, that they're going to be increasingly much more of a work portfolio, and for our jobs, that they're going to become much more of this flexible approach, what about learning? Well, I believe that learning is shifting to a new model of what I call just-in-time and just-in-context. Now, that doesn't mean every single learning experience is going to be something that you can pick up on your digital distraction machine, which we often call a cell phone. But what it does mean is that we're going to have the ability to learn new skills much more rapidly and much more as we approach new problems. Now, of course, the old rules of work, the old rules of learning, the three boxes, we had just a big chunk of learning at the beginning of our work lives. And then we amortize that investment over a period of years or decades. Well, there's a new model of what I call a portfolio of learning, which is that you have these continuous learning experiences. You have these continuous opportunities to be able to dive deep into something and learn something new or to learn something just to be able to solve the problem that's right in front of you. We need to have this portfolio mindset to be lifelong learners so that we are continually building out that portfolio of skills that we have. Now, if, if that's how we're going to approach the categorization and organization of them, what are those skills? How are we going to focus on the different kinds of skills that we could develop? Well, again, this is a big focus of world skills, but there's a hundred different ways to think about skills because each of us has so many different skills. But I want to give you one that is about skills intersections. So we think traditionally in terms of bodies of knowledge being these bins. And so if it was you, one person liked botany and another person thought astronomy was really cool, another person thought robotics was really cool. In our traditional learning institutions, these would be different tracks. They would be different degrees. They would be in different departments within the educational institution. But a young person has a wide range of interests. It's artificial to box them into these different silos. And so the intersection of botany, astronomy, and robotics just turns out to be astrobotany, where there are people that are literally planning how to design vertical farms on Mars so that if Mr. Elon Musk gets his dream, we're all going to be growing plants on another planet someday. And so if you think about this as an opportunity to unbundle the learning situation, to help people create portfolios of learning, it is an opportunity for each of us to follow a range of passions. And the intersection of those passions offers tremendous opportunity for each of us as workers. Now, if, if that's the way we think about how we develop our skills, speaking of robotics, how does technology show up? How do we fit technology into this? Well, I talked earlier about our superpowers, about sort of that, that uh, solving unique problems and using our unique problem solving skills, especially our creativity. Uh, I believe that technology, we can shift the calculus of the way that we've approached technology in the past, which is often about automating those tasks, those mind numbing tasks. And instead, we can put a huge amount of energy into focusing on that upper right quadrant and actually focusing our technologies on enhancing us as human beings. We can use artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotics, all these exponential technologies to help us to rapidly inventory our own skills, to develop new skills. We can use them to collaborate with others more effectively as they're developing their skills. We can understand leaps forward in our own intuition about our neuroscience and the way that our brains work to be able to enhance the learning process to make it more and more effective, especially for those who are neurodiverse. And then, yes, we will also use technology to continually augment us, to be able to help us to continually solve new problems we could never have solved before, and to be able to help us to do that in a dynamic and rapid fashion, often just in time and just in context. Now, this is how we can think about as educational institutions, as learning institutions supporting this process. What do companies need to do differently, especially when it comes to skills? 
Well, companies are increasingly adopting what I've called an enterprise skills model. Think about any big organization and step back and look at it and oversimplify it in the way that I've oversimplified work. It's a bunch of problems to be solved and it's a bunch of human skills to apply to those problems. The problem is that we have these old rules of how we structure work and work roles and they're in hierarchies and we have very specific job descriptions and we tend to have lumped people into these categories and then we make it very, very difficult for them to break out of those categories. But the truth is that every human being in every single organization has a range of skills that they could be bringing to solve these problems and we often don't know or don't care. I often show this picture of an iceberg and I say, as individuals, as humans, we don't know what skills we have. There's a huge amount of human skills under the waterline and we don't even know what those are. And and so that's an opportunity for each of us as individuals to continually learn more and more about our skills. But that is also an opportunity in the enterprise within organizations to uncover all this human capacity, all this human potential, all these potential skills that people could be applying to new problems. And then approach this in a completely different way where work work roles are much more flexible, as I was saying with workforce, with uh, salesforce.com, where the ability of any individual to identify problems within the organization and to be able to solve them becomes a much more flexible fabric of human capacity And rather than these traditional work roles and traditional silos, we unbundle the enterprise of skills. We make these work roles much more flexible. And there's a range of different organizations that are doing this. I'm going to talk about in just a minute about uh, some of the ways that organizations are thinking about that, but essentially see this as an opportunity to be able to restructure work roles. Well, so if we're going to make all these humans more able to be able to apply their their skills to different problems, how are we going to reshape our educational institutions? Well, if you think about education, if you think about the way that we've structured education in many, many systems around the world, is we've sort of arbitrarily assigned it to that first box, that beginning of life. And we've broken it into these boxes within the box of pre-K to to kindergarten, um, elementary and secondary school, and then college and university. And then we sort of stopped it. We made the adult learning part optional in many countries. Well, but think about this as a continuum. What do we need to design for today as we reshape our education systems for this world of exponential change and the Great Reset? And I argue we actually need to think of it as a continuum and we need to think of the goals that we're setting for our the goals of life, our roles in life and the phases of life that we go through. And I want to take each of these very briefly. So the phases of life, if we think of ourselves as a continuum, which we are, we don't have these arbitrary stops in our lives when our schooling stops in one phase and then goes into another we're actually growing and changing people throughout our entire lives. And there's lots of different models for this. This is the one from Institute for Learning. But essentially, there's these different phases that predictably we go through as our bodies, our minds, and our social abilities develop. And we need to think about how we are continually changing our learning institutions to be able to support these different phases of our lives. That is a huge opportunity to rethink how we are designing them. And instead of these arbitrary boxes within the box, to make them a continuum to help people to continually go into the next phase. And no matter what their pace is, no matter what the difference is in how they learn and how they're developing, our systems are far more adaptive to enable them to be able to leverage their own unique skills and talents and interests and experiences. Well, this is actually starting in the adult era, the adult learning era, and it's moving its way back. It's harder and harder in many countries around the world because of the way governments influence early childhood, early learning within our lives. But more and more of the adult learning uh, approaches function like markets. And we're seeing this also happening in colleges and universities. So if we're going to 
I've basically unbundled learning and I'll give you an image for that in just a second, but basically we're going to break apart learning and make it much more of this continuum. We also need to design for the roles of life. That is what in societies do we want people to be good at? Well, early on in our life, we need to be good at being part of a family and we need to be good at having friends. Later in life, we want people to be good adults. We want them to be good workers and professionals and parents and members of their communities and citizens in a country but if we're going to think about what we want them to do, um, what we want them to be able to do, the capacity for workers with the roles of life, we want them to be learners, lifelong learners, continuous learners. So we need to continually change our mindset about how we're designing our systems so that people can occupy these roles in life and continually learn how to be better and better at them. We want people to continually learn how to be better citizens and community members, parents, as well as adults and workers. So if that's the goals of life and roles of life, and I'm sorry, the the the, um, the the phases of life and roles of life. What about the goals of life? Well, Professor Maslow, Abraham Maslow, gave us a nice hierarchy. It doesn't always have to work like a hierarchy, but essentially, what he said was there's these basic needs of physiological needs, what he called, he called hygiene factors, all the way up to self-actualization, feeling like we are doing the work and living the life that we most wanted. I think of this more as a set of deliverables. It's all things we all want at any point in our lives. It's just our, our priorities change. But this is an opportunity for us to redesign so that we think about how each of us, every single human being on the planet, can be that lifelong learner, can continually grow, can create new things, help others, can achieve the goals that they want in life, succeed within a different fields or, or uh, uh, their paths, develop affiliations, have the kind of relationships that they want. And then if they want to acquire things, you know, have the, the, the various uh, aspects of their lives, the things that they own, that they feel are most important to them. So that's how to think about designing for learning institutions and changing, unbundling, breaking them apart, and then rebundling them around these kinds of deliverables. And if we do it right, then what we'll do is we will uncover human capacity all around the world that might never have been uncovered before. You might have seen this amazing story about this young woman in Mexico, a nine-year-old girl who is just starting college. And she was she has autism, but she's on the autism spectrum, but she has, she's she been um, greater with an IQ, that, uh, higher than Albert Einstein and Stephen Hawking as adults. If you think about us, un bundling our learning processes, our learning institutions, so that we can uncover this next Einstein or Stephen Hawking anywhere in the world. This is the, the potential outcome. How will we do that? Well, we're going to unbundle our learning institutions. We're going to take that traditional degree or the traditional approach of sort of boxing the learning. And sure, we'll still have degrees and we'll still have traditional learning experiences for a long, long time to come. But increasingly, we're going to unbundle a lot of that learning and we're going to have online platforms and ways to be able to build hybrid learning experiences to be able to have more and more people have access to learning and to do more of that learning just in time and just in context. Um, I, I happen to have nine courses on LinkedIn learning, which is rather ironic considering I don't have enough college to stuff into a thimble, uh, but I've got over a million learners for my courses. Uh, one one, one uh, course alone on developing a learning mindset has more than a quarter million learners. And so this is the opportunity in this, this great reset is to be able to think of how to be able to provide more and more of this skills development opportunity to more and more people. Now, I mentioned earlier that all of this results in new kinds of organizations. Here's a way to think about that. And then, um, and then I'll wrap up with a couple of thoughts about how we can approach this from a macro standpoint. So traditional organizations, I've often said, are kind of like a box. They have traditional employees, and it's kind of a binary approach. Either somebody works for you or doesn't. They're either an employee or they're not. But along come all these different use cases for work. We have contractors. We have consultants. We have subcontractors, part-time workers, gig workers. There are online communities. Even our former employees that are hopefully referring people to come work at our companies are all part of this sort of fabric of people creating value for the organization. So that old box of the organization is no longer sufficient and a great reset comes along. And what we saw we could do in a very short period of time is we many, many people around the world could do distributed work 
often collaborating with people they had never met before. So this looks like what I call a work net. As I said earlier, not just a workforce and not just a network, but a work net. It's, it's a group of people that are continually creating value for the stakeholders of the organization. And the new organization, or what I often call the next organization, will be the organization that can actually maximize the effectiveness of all these different workers and work roles, a constantly shifting landscape of work, reduce the friction of entry to uh, work, reduce the process and the time that it takes to get somebody identified and onboarded to work with your organization, to continually have a, a, sh a shifting fabric of people that could solve problems, use apprenticeships and mentorships and gig work and project work as ways to continually help people to start engaging with your organization so that you can then shift them to more and more deeper relationships with the organization as time goes on. And increasingly, technology will enable more and more of this. You may have read about organizations that go to the far end of this spectrum that are called digital autonomous organizations or DAOs or DAOs. And that's where everything is virtual. The organization is virtual. The platform on which it works is virtual. The currency that is used to compensate people is, is virtual. All of these things are true of what's called the DAO of Ethereum, which is an organization, a platform on which you can create your own DAO, and it's a currency to compensate people. It's also essentially its own currency, just like a country, where the currency's value can shift depending upon a lot of the agreements of people who market the currency. So this is the way organizations are going to change. How do we then think about the macro impact on work around the world? Well, it's a tremendous opportunity to stop thinking in analog ways and start thinking in digital ways. This is um, from a book by my friend Parag Khanna. And what he talks about is digital flows. This is actually a map of the flow of digital information around the world. Think of this as a flow of skills. Uh, my, my organization has been for several years now been advising a massive jobs training initiative in Ethiopia to help develop a brand new trained workforce and what's called the Nadamco Cloud Initiative to help a brand new workforce to be able to provide services to companies around the world. As we deal with so many of the repercussions of the Great Reset, we realize we can become far more digital we can become far more distributed. We can enable work markets to work with less and less friction. Now, the good news is it means whatever country you're in, your workers will have access to more work. And the challenge is that it's true for everybody else too. And so we need to develop new mechanisms for how we're going to guide workflows. That is how we're going to train workers, how as countries we develop the priorities for what the skills we believe workers need to have and then help them to reduce the friction in access to that work. In many cases, the work will be local. It will be within our country borders, but increasingly we have the capacity to be able to provide that work product to others. And countries are going to increasingly optimize their focus on different kinds of work. They're gonna build their own work ecosystems based on what they think they can best optimize for, the kinds of skills they think that people can be best at. So I've mentioned ecosystems. I'm going to do one final thought, which I think we need a new mindset about ecosystems, especially if your focus is on communities. If you're an educational institution or you're an NGO or a nonprofit that is focused on communities, we need to think in terms of ecosystems. All of these different changes that I've been talking about that are massive opportunities for re- vamping the way we think about how we learn and how we work, the ways that we structure that work and that learning. The best way we can be helpful to as many people as possible is to think of ecosystems, that is all the different elements that help to contribute to creating value for humans in the context of learning and work. And so my, again, my company Charette, we've got an initiative called Learn to Earn and so what we've done is we've mapped learn to earn ecosystems. And we've said, if you take all these different populations, all these different kinds of individuals that are looking for work, and you think about how we can 
revamp the process that communities can provide support as people go through the initial preparation and then training and then access to work and then ultimately having repeatable, sustainable work, we can change policies within countries. We can change the way organizations function. All of these things can work together as an ecosystem if we build radical collaboration in the process of helping to understand these landscapes and then all figuring out how we can continually interconnect our efforts to ensure that no person gets left behind. So I'm going to do a quick review and then hopefully if we've got some questions, maybe we want to run through. But all of these shifts that I'm talking about in the Great Reset are in service of more human-centric work, the shift to problem and project-centric work, helping individuals to build a portfolio of work, ensuring that work roles are co-created between workers and hirers, that more of the learning that we do can be just in time and just in context. That doesn't mean all of it is. We still need to develop mastery in many, many different things. But it means that we shift our thinking from it all having to be locked into more traditional learning experiences. That helps people to build a portfolio of learning. It helps them to be able to accentuate and focus on skills intersections, the, the, the Venn diagram of passions that each of us have. It helps us also to be able to understand how we can apply technologies to help humans to develop those skills much more rapidly, and especially in collaborative fashion. It helps organizations to be able to understand how they can shift to new models of understanding human skills. Hopefully it helps educators to understand how they can build a new fabric of learning that leverages all the traditional strengths of in-person and, and longer term learning experiences with many of the learnings we've gotten in the great reset of unbundled education. It helps organizations to figure out how they can start to become more of that work net model of a much more flexible fabric of work. It helps us also to understand that flows of work are going to increasingly be global. We're going to, people are going to be working for organizations that are outside of their local city, their county, their region, their, their country. We're going to be working more and more as part of a fabric of humans across the planet. And if we use ecosystems thinking to continually interconnect our efforts to make all of these as human-centric as possible, we will ensure that no human gets left behind.